holdover from uh, year five yeah I think so in in the true interest of uh, our little green loving Bruce Dern this episode we're gonna trade in our guns for some coffins beautiful this is double feature my name is Eric and uh, I'm joined all the way over from uh, Chicago Illinois by Michael Kester yeah the weather's uh, you know something here and the temperature is definitely uh, a number you know the weather in the valley is also a uh, temperature oh yeah and it's actually both a temperature in fahrenheit and celsius we have a new adventure on the show today we do and uh if you're tired of such witty banter as this you can use chapters to <laughs> uh, i don't care what the adventure is just give me to the goddamn films so since everyone's using aac we can all use chapters to skip to the movie uh, skip right to Dracula, skip over Dracula into Silent Running, or just skip to the end of the show yeah. and, uh, you know, find out what happens next time. We have a really interesting and inadvertent uh, kind of pair here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to do, I don't, I don't want anything to get spoiled in the intro to the show because that's, uh, that's something we do while we're talking about the individual films. But uh, we have an interesting link between the director of Dracula and the drones in Silent Running. Really? Yes. Oh, so that's coming up. That's a tease is what yeah, that is. Yeah, that's a tease. All right, so what we're going to be doing is some old classic monster stuff. All the big old classics sure. I'd like to, like to do, as much as we have time for. And um, some influential or otherwise important 70s science fiction films that we mm -hmm. haven't already covered. Uh, there's a lot of little gems here and there. And they're, it's a lot less definitive a list than the monster films. Yeah. But we're just going to kind of take them in order and, uh, and go through that stuff. It's kind of very similar to when we did Rocky in Asia and Rocky was cut and dry. It was Rocky one through six. Uh huh. And then some Asian movies that I arbitrarily chose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if we'll have six of these. That's all right. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me. So I think there's four or five. I don't know. But you guys do. Thanks, Kickstarter backers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you back the Kickstarter, why don't you write in and tell us what we're doing this year? Uh, speaking of Kickstarter, writer-director mm -hmm. Monte Legaspi has a feature film called Hollywood Believed that he's working on. Okay. Now, Monte was one of the people who sponsored an episode of the show. Right. And he's going to be the first one we talk about here because uh, his Kickstarter is almost over. So he's right about in the pit of terror right now. Sure. If you uh, check out his Facebook or the Kickstarter, you can learn a bit about the film. I would actually, it's, a, it's kind of a film noir take. Mm -hmm. I guess it's very much a film noir take. And Monty's a really interesting guy. I met him a long time ago. I was in Hollywood for a birthday massacre show mm -hmm. when I was uh, still bootlegging their shows for my DVDs. <laughs> And we met and we kind of bonded over. I was hiding the camera in my giant goth boots. Yeah, right. Uh, at the time to bootleg the shows. Right. Um, we should talk about that at some point. Not now. But I met Monty that way. And I guess he found our show, started listening to it uh, from probably my Facebook or something, has been a listener for a long time and helped us on Kickstarter. And now we're going to help his Kickstarter. Go to kickstarter.com, type in Hollywood Believed. And you could see a whole fucking thing about their movie. They did a great job of what they want the movie to be. Here's the style we're looking for. Here's bits from all the actors and crew. They got some really interesting music stuff. Uh, it looks really, really interesting. I hope it gets funded because I would actually make the, I think it's like a six to nine hour trek down to Hollywood from the Valley to, uh, I don't know, do something for their movie. Watch yeah. them work hard and provide no help at all. All right, so with that out of the way, I guess we, uh, we talk about Dracula. Yeah, so we've, uh, we've seen versions of bits of this film probably at least 10 times in the overarching coverage of Double Feature. We've, uh, we've definitely seen a heavy version of 1931's Dracula when we did Ed Wood. Yeah, sure. We got a good look at 
what happened to Bella Lugosi following Dracula and the kind of life <laughs> sure. he should have been living after the success of becoming one of horror's most iconic movie monsters. Yeah. And uh, eventually this role was reprised by basically every actor that we love <laughs> from before 1970. Yeah. Uh, I know Christopher Lee was a Dracula and I know that, uh, that we had Peter Cushing was involved in some of the Dracula films. Oh, fucking Gary Oldman was a Dracula. Yeah, exactly. We get, we get uh, an endless amount of Draculas coming, but uh, the classic Bela Lugosi's Dracula, directed by Freaks Todd Browning, nonetheless, yeah. is the one that you, you need to see a single image to get to the entire film. And for me, that image is Bella Lugosi giving that stare with the light just sure, shining sure. on his eyes. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the iconic eye lighting yeah. that uh, would get more subtle in the decades that followed. Yeah. <laughs> Literally just someone, you know, shining a light in his eyes to give him that kind of the romantic glare. That sure. was uh, the, the trance of Bella Lugosi. And it's, it's a very understated role. He doesn't say a whole lot. He kind of mills around and becomes a goofy bat yeah it is for as little as he says the thing that i thought was most interesting going back to this about the character of dracula is in stark contrast from the monster movies we see today there was no bones about don't show the monster right that was not even <laughs> in the in the peripheral vision of uh these filmmakers i mean this was far before that concept even existed but we show bella lugosi as dracula right away yeah i mean right away mm -hmm. we hadn't invented don't show the monster yet but we hadn't even really thought about i mean i guess the movie monsters were just considered differently back then you know we don't want any lead up we want to be introduced to dracula because he's one of the fucking characters right we're introduced to my buddy ren yeah we uh you know we take a look at the town we see dracula that's it yep and um, we're not even really sure to what degree his supernatural powers extend in the beginning. He's just a sure. fucking weird dude who has a bunch of real estate problems. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to be what the movie's about. Um, there is a way that they shoot him with that eye light or with the, the backlight. Mm -hmm. This guy's got jet black hair. We're dealing with uh, grayscale. Yeah. You know, a black and white movie. And really, um, very few tones of black and white. Sure. You know, things are pitch black and bright white. And so we use that, uh, what became a very distinctive kind of outline to see his jet black hair against the background. So the way they light him, I think, is a lot of what people think about as Bella Lugosi as Dracula. Sure. But um, Bella probably deserves some of that credit too. Oh, yeah? yeah. I mean, you don't. You have to keep in mind that that with a lot of these classic original monster flicks, he had nothing to go off of, right? Except for the uh, Bram Stoker novel, which they—I mean, I don't even know if they read it when they <laughs> made this movie. Um, they have the names in there, yeah. But it's oddly enough, you don't think the underlying real estate plot is really what drives. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, I, I'm also pretty confident that Bram Stoker's Dracula doesn't involve Dracula in a box on a boat to the States. Uh, there is a little bit of Dracula uh, in a box on a boat, but I don't, uh, it's been so long since I've read it. Yeah. I don't think, I think it's glossed over. Yeah. I actually feel that like that's an untapped story right there. Dracula on Dracula a boat. Dracula on a boat, picking off the crew one by one. How is uh -huh. that not a film? You just mentioned all these guys do Dracula. Why don't we have a Dracula on a boat film? It's called Jason Takes Manhattan. Wow, that's actually exactly what. <laughs> so what I'm calling for is Jason Takes Manhattan with Dracula. And if that came out, I would probably go, they're just stealing the idea from Jason Takes Manhattan. <laughs> what fucking ever. I still think it's a good idea, Dracula. I do too. On a well, boat. I think that Dracula, we've, we've covered enough vampires to know that, that vampires are one of the more oddly uh, polarizing monster forces when it comes to sympathy because they are undead but they are not zombies mm -hmm. zombies have no soul and no being and they're not the mummy which is just a scary walks around right groans thing makes out a lot less while us making out in the mummy films they're also not frankenstein's monster which is iconic for being horrifying but innocent mm -hmm. draculas are evil yeah. And uh, they, they feed on life and they want to suck blood and 
pull the string and their only their only intention is uh to prolong their own curse by sucking the life force out of innocence and so there isn't a sympathy but there is an identity to vampires especially dracula as the namesake that bella lugosi i think pulls off really well because you never like him mm-hmm. he he's kind of around and every time you see him you're just like man this guy is this guy's relentless right you never once sit there and go but he needs to do it to survive right <laughs> <laughs> you know at the same time though they do have to give that um allure to the vampire he does have to be a mysterious creature you want to see sure. him more but he's not the dastardly villain who you love to hate he's instead this guy who there's something mysterious about him and people seem magnetically drawn to him and what is that about and it uh it keeps you guessing a little bit uh maybe not today but certainly right. you know in 1930 uh 31 dracula right 1931 right. todd yeah. browning's dracula i think we're the only show that comes to this from the angle if you like freaks you'll love dracula <laughs> Does anybody watch those in that order but we do have other characters in this that have become um you know really memorable through the rest of cinema i think van helsing yeah maybe not getting a lot of i remember of course the van helsing movie or some of the b-grade van helsing stuff you could argue it's all b-grade uh-huh. van helsing stuff <laughs> but being a name a comic book character a um you know, somebody who has kind of his own legend sure. at this point. And you also get uh, the Harkers, which are big, big, big horror vampire names. Um, way back year one, I don't know if you remember, but Mina Harker was the vampire lady in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, no, I don't. So even getting a nod as a literary character. Sure. Back in LXG, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, that, is that show still even, did we, that, that got lost in a studio fire. <laughs> Yeah. And and that's weird because the Harker characters in this film and, and also in the Dracula novel, um, they are the human characters that basically get put right up against Dracula. They're mm-hmm. they're the people we're supposed to be identifying with and that we're supposed to be terrified of becoming and and ending up in their situation. Um I mean, of the obvious, there are the obvious deficiencies of being a vampire that we saw really heavily in Fright Night, which is um, that you can't go outside when it's daytime, and if sunlight hits you, you turn into a bat that explodes. Sure. Garlic crosses, you know, the huge. And so Harker served to line up all of the victims when Dracula couldn't be bothered because he was, he was too busy you know, sleeping in a casket or whatever. Sure. And uh, Mina Harker represents this innocent, she's the ultimate sacrifice, right? Right. It's an available meal. And so she becomes the sacrifice that Harker has to make um, for being in bed with, with such an evil being. One of the things I wanted to look at when we go back and do a lot of these monster movies is how the mythologies changed over time. Right. And so many people, you know, having retold this tale, it's gotten uh, so different. I mean, the fact that Dracula can take the form of a wolf in this, I think that's right. a lot different than any. We clearly gave up that territory to the wolfman in the 40s. We just said, well, we're not going yeah. to do that anymore. Although I'm sure there's instances of it after that. But that whole dies during the day versus dies during the night having different effects. Mm-hmm. I love handing uh, handing him the cross in the beginning. Talk about a hamster style. They basically yeah. pause the movie on the frame. Everybody, does everybody in the theater see the, it's the only thing on the screen, the cross? That's going to come into play later. Look at the cross. Mm-hmm. My favorite one is transporting the boxes of Earth. I always thought that was a really bizarre part of Dracula yeah. was... Well, he has to sleep in the original the original ground, but, you know, he wants a new castle. So we're just going to bring over boxes of Earth. Mm-hmm. The whole real estate plot of the movie is such a weird focus. Yeah. It's so much about, you know, the shifting times. And that's something I think we'll see a lot in the monster movies, too, is what they use as their excuse to have a monster movie. Sure. We would not have a Dracula movie today that has a real estate plot. That's fucking weird. Yeah. But then also Dracula's kind of concubines. That's mm-hmm. uh, another part of, a big part of um, the original novel 
that I don't think you see. I mean, the whole idea of romance we've talked a lot about with different versions of vampires and how we didn't like that at all at first. And then we kind of got to Fright Night and we went, okay, maybe there's a place for that. Sure. I think that's probably, you know, a large part of the metaphor of Dracula. So all of these classic monster movies are probably going to have some, I can think of a couple off the top of my head, but some kind of underlying metaphor or maybe overt at the time before we've been bogged down by all these other things and culture that Dracula means. Right. At the time Dracula came out, it seems like it was very much about uh, sexuality. Yeah. You know, it was very much about sure. the romantic element, the being uh, seduced by Dracula. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't help it. He had a supernatural power of seduction that, well, I can't possibly, you know, it's Dracula. He's a supernatural yeah. creature. Of course, I'm going to give myself to him. What are you crazy? I can't help it. It's not my fault. <laughs> right. I don't have wants of the flesh. I'm a human yeah. being in the 1930s. Right. Thank you. This is exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. I'm glad you see that too. Uh, the concubines in the novel even more, I mean, they're all over John. You know, there's a, there's a moment, um, again, I haven't read this in 15, maybe 20 years. Is it possible I read this when I was seven? That's uh, actually, maybe. <laughs> I, I remember a scene where they're seducing him and Dracula stops them because he claims Jonathan as his own, you know, <laughs> as if he's my meal or my, right. you know, whatever. There, I, I remember even at a young age thinking there was a lot of sexual imagery, even between Dracula and Jonathan, right. as, far as, uh, as far as what's going on. You know, Dracula seems to have these people that he just, he has total control over in the same way we talked about on Fright Night, just by giving them that glance. Right. That was part of the stare is, wow, what a creep but also I'll follow him to the ends of the earth and sure. do his bidding. Right. You know, there was a weird kind of sadomasochistic thing about it too. But I, I think you hit on it. It's not just an S&M thing. It's not an S&M thing at all, probably. It's a, uh, people are in the 1930s and they're good and proper and they're not going to, yeah, they don't think about these things at all. Dracula forces them to think about right. these things. <laughs> <laughs> so we were having this seductive story, but we were doing it as a monster film. And as we'll probably see with some of the other monster films, by disguising it as a monster film, we can go, well, no, 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 we're not, we're not watching like a steamy romance thing. We're, we're watching Dracula. It's scary. Right. It's very, right. it borders on satanic. It's, there's no, there's no sexuality at all. <laughs> the biting on the neck. And also in the original Dracula story, the idea of having to exchange blood instead of just take the blood. Right. You know, that's something I think Anne Rice did a lot too, was the suck the blood and then give the blood back and they become a vampire instead of just dying. Right. That kind of transmission of, uh, sure. of blood between the two. Mm -hmm. This is before the, um, the awakening to sexually transmitted diseases too. So it's not even talking about that. It's literally just, that's the thing that separates it from rape. Yeah, he has power over you. Right. But you guys are actually kind of having a little bit of an exchange going on there. I think it's fun to consider the metaphor of these because, uh, again, I think they were probably really overt at the time. Right. I think anybody who thought about Dracula when it came out probably thought about that. But, you know, the, the legend and the lore has been used uh, so much over the decades to mean so many different things that people kind of forget at its core what is sexy vampire Dracula about. Right. And now we have to kind of go back and decode knowledge we once had. Uh, because this has become such an icon and has been used for so many different things that it's hard to look at the original Dracula as just what it's displaying and not go, oh yeah, that's the guy. That's the original guy right. who is all the other Draculas. So it's bringing sex into light, uh, but also promiscuity. I think even more so, that's, if you really want to get to the core of what it's talking about, right. it's the idea of adultery, it's the idea of promiscuity, of not committing yourself to one person, but just kind of going off and having flings with sure. random vampires. Right. I think probably more about loose sexuality than adultery, but you also have, you know, they're coming in as a couple, she's married, this guy's pulling her away. So there is a weird sort of adultery fantasy to it. Right. And God, you went in an era where sex wasn't even very open. I don't even think sex had been invented yet. <laughs> well, to think publicly about adultery, I mean, could sure. you imagine that? 
you can't have a conversation about adultery. You're not even supposed to have conversations about sex. Right. So who's going to talk about the very natural unspoken thing of, man, I've been with one person for a long time, but sometimes I have secret fantasies about other men. Vampires. The, yeah. I think about that from the woman's side all the time, but I guess the men too. Sure. But Dracula's hitting on dudes all the time. Yeah. Well, Dracula, Dracula, he's not a heartthrob. You know what I mean? He's right. not, um, he's not what you're typical Hollywood movie actor is to women. He's not the guy that you think is a wonderful man and and would be a dream husband. And he's a great, (laughs) he's a great dancer and singer. And he's the original bad boy, Michael. Sure. Well, he's, he's not sexy because he's sexy. He's sexy because he's got the power of the devil. Exactly. And, and that is why that's the difference between, uh, your, your typical star, from Hollywood and somebody like Bella Lugosi as Dracula is he's not sexy because you think he's appealing, right? He's sexy because you have no choice but to want to have sex with him. And he doesn't care. (laughs) He doesn't care if you're a man or woman because he's only into you for your body and (laughs) you will acquiesce. All right. So you know what I'm talking about. There was one other thing that surprised me about Dracula is that there was still a little bit of creepy to it. Oh, yeah. You know, there was a little bit of, uh, especially, you know, the bats flapping out the window. It looks fucking ridiculous. It's not scary. Mm -hmm. That camera slowly pans back to the top of the bed and Mm -hmm. then, you know, or from the top of the bed, I guess. And uh, he's standing there. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there's no score to it. Right. You know, the movie makes use early on. It opens with the swan theme. And it's instantly recognizable, and it's become this classic, probably, again, a classic before Dracula. Mm -hmm. But it's such a well-recognized piece of music, in part because of Dracula. And to have these lengthy scenes with no score or no sound to them, when he comes back, it's kind of startling. They don't even need the, uh, the music that kicks in unexpectedly to really make you jump. Right. You just see him, and it creeps on you. You have a million things to say about Silent Running. Oh my God. It's bizarre because, so we did uh, Bicentennial Man not too long ago on Double Feature. Yeah. Which we both uh, kind of made jabs at being the longest film ever created by human hands. (laughs) Silent Running, I don't know if you knew this or not, is apparently an hour and a half long. Yeah. It's Uh, also the rare G-rated film here on Double Feature. Yeah. And Silent Running, it felt, for me, it felt like maybe 40 minutes. Yeah, it's very quick. Of of movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I, I teased this in the beginning, so we'll get this we'll we'll start here. Todd Browning directed Dracula. Uh Todd Browning also directed Freaks, which we covered uh I believe that was what last year, year before on Double Feature. Year before we did it, uh if you'll remember we did it with the David Lynch movie Lost Highway. No, the straight story. <laughs> there it is. That's right. So I don't know if you knew this, but the drones, which end up becoming major players in this film. Major players. That's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, did you know that they're portrayed by people who are bilateral amputees? You know, I had, uh, I had guessed such by the way the feet seemed to... Whoever engineered, whoever designed those drones, mm-hmm. the industrial designers on those drones put a lot of attention into making sure they had, uh, they had digits on them yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Uh, or some kind of... Uh, I don't know what those are. Traction pads. Right. So um, it, we talked about in Freaks the idea of instead of uh, getting, you know, people to look like they, they're amputees or they're the pillow man or, you know, whatever, just hire the fucking pillow man. Yeah, sure. And, I and also, here we're showcasing them. They're, yeah. they're the only people to talk to in space. Sure. and And they're probably... I mean, that's not an easy role to play. The no. humanity in those drones uh, is a very thin line to walk. Yeah. We've seen plenty of films on Double Feature that are about the lonely solace that is space travel. Uh, Moon, right. perfect example. If you have nobody, you turn to your computer. Sure. Kind of just like uh, when you need to get off. <laughs> right. So the thing about these drones in Silent Running is we have Bruce Dern, who. Uh, who is one of my favorite 70s exploitation actors. He's in um, Wild Angels and a few other things. He was supposed to be in um, Lords of Salem. Sure. But he had a scheduling conflict. Anyway, Bruce Made Dern, his way into Django Unchained. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And uh, well, the thing is, is Bruce Dern is a crazy person in this film. <laughs> Right. He plays the worst botanist in space. He's I an believe. absolute psychopath. Forgets that the sun is necessary <laughs> for plant life. Yeah, he's crazy. So to have these drones that have to be somehow sympathetic and more human than the crazy murderer guy. <laughs> yep. It's really, really interesting to, to when, uh, what is it, Louis is the first one we lose before he's even got a name. Yeah. And he's holding on and, and, uh, and Lowell is telling him, you know, hold on, Louis, follow the other guys. Yeah. And he goes careening off into outer space. And that's the first, it's the first moment in the film that my heart breaks. And this is, this is following. <laughs> Not during the murder. That's what I was just going to say. This is following the murder of three human beings. Yeah. And also the, the wanton jettison and destruction of all plant life left yep. in the known universe. Sure. And the first time I get sad is when we lose the first drone. It's so funny that you describe Bruce Dern as crazy person because that's very telling for how you and I look at the movie. Because I don't know if in the script it says cut to Bruce Dern crazy person. Right. You know what I mean? I don't think it says fade in, look at Freeman. He's talking to bunny rabbits. He's clearly a psychopath. Right. Look at how he doesn't know anything about botany. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, I think the script thinks he's the champion of the story. Sure. I think the movie thinks he's the champion of the story. I mean, we've talked about this over and over. Uh, it doesn't even really matter what the movie thinks. There's so many hands go into making the movie. It's possible that director Douglas Trumbull thought he was the hero. Bruce Dern chose to portray him like he's nuts. Douglas thought he was a crazy person. Bruce Stern read it and goes, I, I'll just play myself because I am a psychopathic environmentalist. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I mean, who fucking knows? Yeah. But this movie is, I think it has to be a little bit funnier than sure. it knows it's being, especially with the music choices. Oh, yeah. We're going to nuke all the forests and then cut to him rolling around in the park with bunny rabbits yeah. and the music playing. Yeah. It's just uh, right after everyone gives him crap for being a big environmental hippie. And so I look at that and I go, the movie has to know he's crazy. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe the movie's being cynical about humanity and saying, in the future, where there's only one sacred hippie left yeah. and everybody right. else is a, a corporate apologist who wants to nuke all the forests. Well, that's totally, I mean, that is a big aspect of the film. You have to keep in mind it came out in the very early part of the 1970s, which is mm -hmm. right on the heels of the Summer of Love and hippies are the counterculture at this point and everybody's believing that yeah if we don't take a stand now we'll end up in a future where sure you can't sell a tree that matters wow it's as if we always fucking think that <laughs> we have an alarmist component hard-coded in our dna that forces us to worry that this is the last second <laughs> before the bottom drops out and so freeman represents the the summer of love hippies and he's the one that's that's persevered and made it all the way through against all odds to outer space to protect the last serene peaceful part of planet earth right and i think part of it is there i get like one of the things that i definitely do get other than the fact that freeman is kind of nuts mm -hmm. is that the other three guys on the ship are kind of dicks <laughs> you think so well so I was reading into this film because, like I said, I fucking loved it and I can't, I couldn't figure out why because very little happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also it seems to have an environmental message right. that neither of us really give a fuck about. Yeah. And, but yeah, I'm in the same place. And I was reading that the film initially didn't have an environmental bent and that it was, oh, really? It was more about how uh, they were all out in space and the ships had been uh, asked to return to Earth to be decommissioned. And uh, all the military people on board were going to be basic. Essentially, the film was about unemployment. And Freeman went off on his own random tangent because he didn't want to be just suddenly out of a job. And he thought that was unfair. So he sure. wasn't about to go back to Earth where he was going to be, you know, honorably discharged from his service or what the fuck right, ever. And right. also he's taking care of some flowers. Sure. But I don't know. I feel like in 1971, something like flower power, something like, you know, this is, this is a thing that uh, people want to see in movies. Yeah. So we get a good aspect of the, the flower power thing 
with these biodomes. Yeah. And as much as I don't think of myself as an environmentalist or somebody who feels like we're in a constant in state of environmental collapse, when the message comes from Earth to jettison and nuke all the plants. <laughs> it is hard to... Uh, yeah. Part of me, part of me goes, yeah. okay, well... Even the prominent American Airlines corporate branding doesn't sure. solicit your... Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's... I'm sitting here going, okay, maybe not as... Maybe not... Uh, as necessary as you need to murder three people to preserve this. Sure. But I don't know if you can send them to a different ship and protect the plant life. Right. I think maybe that's not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anytime the question comes down to uh, human life for me, human life wins, even when it's stupid. Even when the question is, would you nuke every remaining plant in space, in existence, known existence, or kill one human, I would go, Oh, yeah, we'll definitely nuke the plants. I'm not going to kill anybody. What are you, crazy? Right. That's a human life. That's infinitely valuable. Nuke all the plants. Sure. But God, man, even I would have trouble nuking the little gray bunny. Yeah. I mean, well, what are you, you, cold, heartless son of a bitch? And, and the other thing that's so compelling about this film and, and about Bruce Stern as Freeman is uh, that conversation that I was, like I've said, I would, under any other circumstance, be like, oh, dude, shut up. Because it's the, <laughs> it's the organic it's the organic food conversation. Yeah. Where he's right. sitting there going, look at this. You're eating this crap and you're okay with it. And this this is something right. I made and I grew with my own hands. And it has a, a mass and it has a, a, a worth and it's, you know, it has a, a sure. flavor and it's made of something. Right. I'm sitting there going, well, I mean, I would rather eat that cantaloupe. I mean, yeah. if, if we're all being honest, I would rather, sure. I would rather eat a cantaloupe than a pop tart. Yeah. Um, but is that cantaloupe worth three human lives? Well, I don't know. <laughs> In, I'm sitting there, you know, well, probably not. Is that cantaloupe worth three human lives and two droids? Well, absolutely not. Those droids are adorable. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're, I also really like the part where the droids, uh, the droids are you and I when they're playing, when they're playing poker. Oh yeah, that's how we play poker. He calls Absolutely. us. He calls us in. We don't really know what we're doing, uh -huh. and then you and I are like, "Look at my hand. This is awesome." And and he's like, "Are you guys talking? You guys shouldn't be talking. This is poker." And we're like, "This guy's crazy." Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then we have nothing. Right. It's the, <laughs> it's the how the fuck do you play poker? You have no idea how many times I've tried to figure out how to play poker. I'm just. I don't think I'm the stupidest person on planet Earth, but God. Yeah. If we were all playing poker, I would be the dumbest person on planet Earth. I play, I play poker, and I think I'm brilliant because I bluff every hand. <laughs> like, they'll never expect yeah. me to bluff this hand, and then I lose, and I go, how did you know I was bluffing? And the response right. is, you bluff every hand. Right. <laughs> I think uh, poker's probably a lot more chance than I, I think I'm overthinking it, and it's all about bluffing, and I'm refusing to believe that, and that's why I suck. Right. Poker theory, you're on double feature. But I don't think this is an entirely, you know, anti-humanist sort of movie. The way that Freeman has this relationship with his crew where he totally talks down to them, he has this sort of seniority, and he's got to do work while they're just fucking around. And, uh, and then he loses the crew, and I feel like that poker scene is kind of showing that he misses them. Mm -hmm. He might just be bored in space. I don't know. I'm not sure the movie, you know, even really thought about this. But I'm watching it going, well, obviously, he's training them to play poker because, I mean, maybe the movie has thought about it, right? Because in the beginning, his friend wants to play poker with him. Sure. His uh, coworker, you know, invites him directly. Hey, want to play poker? Eh, later, I'm busy. <laughs> and then, sure enough, teaches the robots to play poker because he misses that human companionship. Right. Even if only just a little bit. And, uh, and, and you're right. The thing that, the thing that I think is... Uh really interesting about the way this film arcs is that we get this moment where he kills everybody and uh commander so-and-so says oh we'll come and get you boy just make sure you jettison that last tree yeah <laughs> and right. uh and bruce turns like oh yeah oh, oh this is uh <laughs> you're breaking up and the tree is stuck to the <laughs> ship so bruce turn out and um and so what I think is so interesting is that when they find him again, when that radio voice comes over the radar dish speaker, I've already 
given in to the point where the film is like, wait, there's people. Why are there people? No, this is about this guy and these aliens. Yeah, and, sure. And the tomatoes that he's growing. The droids, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> You're already personifying them a bit by calling them aliens. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, that's another thing is the original script involved aliens. Did I not mention this? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. The, the, the original ending to the film, and, and this is what I was kind of working towards, is he gets, he gets found again. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you go, oh, no, he's got to jettison the trees or they're going to jettison them for him. Right. And part of me is interested that he doesn't seem to care that there's been three murders. He's sure. He's not sitting there going, they're going to find out that I murdered people. Yep. He's sitting there going, they're going to hurt the bunny. Right. <laughs> right. But uh, the original the original gravity for the end of the script was that he makes contacts with an alien race mm -hmm. and he's trying to find the aliens before they quote before the the American Airlines people quote rescue him. Yeah, sure. And so his uh his final move in the original script is to put Dewey in the dome and jettison it very similarly sure. to the way this film ends. Yeah. And then, you know, blow himself up and and whatever and then Dewey eventually uh makes contact with the aliens and tries to be all Oh, sure. Um but they cut the aliens out because this movie is more about plant life. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> Less aliens, more plants. Shut up. I know how to sell movies. And so we get this really wonderful moment in the film where he forgets that sunlight needs to uh, be administered <laughs> to plants. Yeah. Which I can definitely see why you might chalk that up as what a terrible botanist. Uh huh. But he is so concerned with keeping these plants alive that he's running away from sun. Uh, he's running away from light, and he has these magic solar light bulbs, apparently, which solve that problem. Yeah, I forgot about these things in the shed <laughs> back here. Yeah, but the uh, the image that I love about this film, mm -hmm. um, it gives us this notion that in a future where X variable X is wiped out, there is still a cute little droid watering X orbiting all around space. Sure, you know what I mean. Um, yeah you know some animal that's extinct or the the last fucking delorean or whatever you want to say earth has ruined right maybe somewhere out there there's a little droid that's learned to water the delorean <laughs> and then you know suicide the other obvious out for a uh, multiple murderer who disobeys his military command yeah, i find the suicide interesting uh being that he you know, he kind of finds the courage for it. He says he doesn't have the courage. I don't know if he was being honest uh, or not about it, but maybe just, you know, through the journey he's had, he finally sees a reason to end his own life. Yeah, the, the suicide is one of the things that uh, I think ends up being, well, there's no more plants to look after. And so sure. my life as a botanist is completely useless. You know what I mean? He's sure. He's dedicated his life to being a botanist. And so... That's a really interesting choice, I think, from a filmmaking standpoint, because the original script called for him to, I don't know, not want humans to meet aliens for some reason. Sure, sure. Um, but instead, this film goes, this guy who had an overarching reason to live has given that up, and now he's going to kill himself, which honestly, I think as much as I would like to see aliens meet a droid, um, right. <laughs> I think from a filmmaking standpoint, I think that's a more compelling way for Freeman Lowell to, to, to sign out of the universe is right. to go, well, the plants are being taken care of and there's no more. What else does Freeman Lowell have to do? Yeah. We didn't talk a lot about Douglas Trumbull, uh, who was the director, but he designed effects for 2001, mm -hmm. uh, Kubrick's film. He worked on... The Andromeda Strain, which is another really influential sure. uh, science fiction film. When they made Saturn in this movie, it was a big fucking deal, effects-wise, to get that done. And uh, Silent Running, for being one of the more obscure sci-fi titles we'll probably cover uh, as we go through these, I think has had a lot of influence. Um, we don't want to get in trouble by saying what did or didn't influence Star Wars again. But to look at the droids that came later in Star Wars, it's kind of hard for me to look at those and not see some of the droids here. Sure. But uh, if not Star Wars, a lot of other science fiction work that Silent Running has had some kind of impression on. 
with the website being doublefeatureshow.com and the email address being doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, I wanted to also give thanks to our executive producers. The actual, uh-huh. finally, after all these years, we have some real executive producers. Right. Uh, the financial backers of this show, uh, particularly at that Kickstarter level. And that is Flint Ironstag, Maxwell Harley, Meta Somerville, and Hannah Hughes. Uh, thank you guys so much for your help with the show and for being our executive producers. Also, we mentioned Monty's Kickstarter. Um, go to kickstarter.com. It's called Hollywood Believed. Yep. So we're going to do some, uh, some more movies on the show next time. Yeah, we are. We're going uh, to do some more modern horror. We're going to do The Killing Room and Triangle. I believe that is also a uh, listener-suggested component to that episode. That's correct. So watch more fucking film. Bye.